So this morning, we are concluding our Arise series. Uh, we have been in this series since Easter Sunday, and it has kind of chronicled the time after Jesus rose from the dead and what happened with that. We've been challenged over the last few weeks to arise to live, arise to think differently, uh, arise to do good works, arise to see our new vision and mission statement. Thank you, last week. And so today we're going to be talking about one last champion arise motive. Uh, but I wanted to take some time before we do that to remind you of what CCF's new mission and vision statement is going to be moving forward. Because I think that as a church, we need to come under unity with this mantra. So CCF's mission is, and it's very simple, CCF exists to love God, to love others, and to make disciples. How simple is that, right? Simple, but very, very complex when you really unpack it, right? But CCF, it exists to love God, love others, and make disciples. And then our vision is that CCF desires to glorify God, expand his kingdom by being worshipers and witnesses of Jesus who influence the world to experience transformation and express his gospel. Lots of power in those words. And that is where our Arise series has kind of gotten us is to push forward this new mission and vision of CCF. After Christ's resurrection, people started to feel hope and life and new kingdom on earth. And that same power of the resurrection continues to arise today. And that is where the series has come out of. Next week, we're going to be starting a brand new series that, that we're calling Blessed. And we're going to be in the book of Ephesians for about five or six weeks, which is going to be a very, very fun uh, experience to go through an entire book together. But we're going to be concluding arise today. So are we ready? I love it. All right, turn with me to Luke 24. Today, we are going to finish the series by being challenged to arise, to be an honest church, to, and to follow Christ. Those are our goals, learning what an honest church looks like and learning to follow Christ. So Luke 24, as you're turning there, I want to give you some context because you know me and context, I think it's the best thing for understanding scripture. So within these two stories that we are going to be exploring, prior to these two stories, Luke 24 starts out with Jesus being buried in the tomb and it's Sunday morning, it's the third day. And two women come to change out the dressings and to check on the tomb and lo and behold, the stone has been rolled away, right? And they ask, where is, where is our king? Where is Jesus? And the angel says, he's not here, go. And so they run and they go start telling people about what they just experienced, that the tomb is empty, he is not not there anymore. And that's where we're picking up in Luke 24. One of my most favorite stories, the road to Emmaus. And we've talked about this story before, but we're going to be looking at it from a different lens today. So if you have your Bibles, go to verse 13, and that's where we're picking up, all right? So the women have gone out. They've told a bunch of disciples about this. They've told a bunch of people. And now there are two disciples that are walking down this long road. And this is where we pick up. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still. They stopped, their faces downcast, and one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? Now, I like reading it like that because I really believe that that's how he asked Jesus. Are you the only person in this whole place that doesn't know what has happened? So a few things about this story and how it's set up. It was not uncommon for people who are walking down roads, especially this expansive road that lasts seven miles, to walk in groups. We know from the Good Samaritan story that people were often mugged or robbed on the road if they were by themselves. And so it wouldn't be weird for Jesus, this, this person, they don't recognize him, to join them walking because you're safer in numbers, right? So as they're walking, 
they are discussing, the two disciples are discussing, but oftentimes what happened is they didn't have social media back then. They could not go on the internet and get news or turn on a TV and get news. They had to do it by word of mouth. And with this kind of news, executions were a very juicy topic back then. If you were getting publicly executed, that was something to talk about. And often it happened, which sounds very morbid, but it happened around meals. People would sit down at a table and they, what's the latest news? What have you heard? And so this kind of execution that they just experienced would have been the tea of all teas, right? They, people were talking about this. Jesus was famous. Jesus had done miracles. Jesus was prominent. And the religious leaders and politicians executed him. Everybody is talking about this. So Cleopas's question to this stranger, are you the only one who doesn't know of these things? It was mind-boggling to this person that this, this random stranger had not heard what had transpired over the weekend, all right? So let's pick up in verse 14. I mean, sorry, in verse 19. What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we hoped that he would be the one who was gonna redeem Israel and what is more, it, it's the third day and that all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning and they didn't find the body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. So right off the bat, Cleopas starts naming all of these different things that transpired while well, we were following this amazing man, this prophet, that we hoped that he was the Messiah. And what's more, it's the third day, and we kind of know from Scripture the third day was supposed to be something big, and the women couldn't find the body, and then more disciples went and couldn't find the body, but we just don't know what it means. <laughs> I love these disciples that are walking because they literally list all of the prophecies that have come true in describing to this stranger what had transpired, and yet they were still doubting, right? And yet they still couldn't wrap their minds around what was happening. They were struggling with it. Now, we have to understand that this doubt that they had, we can often look at it and be like, what were they thinking? How could they doubt? He literally listed all of the things. But we have to remember that there were several different huge things that allowed them to kind of doubt what had just transpired. The first one was their religious leaders. And if you've been here for the last few weeks, you've kind of learned religious leaders held a lot of power in that time, Mo massive amount of power. And the religious leaders were the ones that crucified Jesus. The people that were teaching them the Torah, teaching them the religious sacrifices, teaching them in the temples, they were the ones that crucified Jesus. That has to mess with their minds at some point. What's more, it wasn't just them, it was the politicians that crucified Jesus. The people that were literally in power to run the cities were the ones that crucified Jesus as well. Obviously the crowds too, but they were the ones that led the charge. That absolutely would have put doubt in people's minds that these people in power, these people who are leaders amongst the community did not believe in Jesus. Two, what Jesus did while he was on this earth, how he came to this earth, how he led his ministry, and then the, the crucifixion and resurrection itself was not, uh, in kind of alignment with what the disciples thought the messianic reveal would be. They thought it was gonna be pomp and circumstance. How many of you watched the coronation this weekend? Some of you? Oh, not a lot of you. Okay, that's okay. It's, that's way over on the other side of the, you know, the ocean. That's all right. But if you go online, you'll see a lot of pictures of the pomp and circumstance of the coronation. 
I truly believe that's kind of what the disciples and the people in that time thought the, the Messiah was gonna be. This pomp and circumstance, parade, loud, uh, ornately dressed, coming to just save everybody. That was their understanding of what Jesus was gonna be. And yet, what did he do? He came to a virgin and was born in a stable and worked as a carpenter for 30 years and then did three years of ministry. Granted, amazing signs and wonders, right? But was never the overthrower that they thought he was gonna be. So strike two kind of on, we can kind of understand their doubt now. And then the third one is a little hard for me to swallow, but it plays a role, is that they first heard about Jesus not being in the tomb from two women. And unfortunately back then, and thankfully this has changed a lot, women were seen as unstable and undependable. Oh, right? But women were seen as unstable and undependable, and they were the ones that found the tomb empty. And so right off the bat, a lot of people discredited their account because of just their gender. So now all of a sudden we have all of these things playing into probably why these two disciples were so doubtful, even though they could list the prophecies in order. So let's pick up in verse 25. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Whew. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Wow. Like, talk about the ultimate Bible lesson, right? And again, they don't know who this person is, so he just starts unleashing all of this incredible knowledge about scripture and Moses and the prophets and taking them through the prophecies that led up to the time of that weekend. And they were so amazed at this knowledge. But here's what I think is really important about this, is that Jesus reminds the disciples that everything that has transpired up until this point served to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. There was a purpose behind all of this. And he was patient with these two disciples. He was so patient. You know, sometimes I think that if you look at how parents uh, kind of walk alongside of kids nowadays, there's a lot of emphasis on, hey, your feelings matter. What you feel is not wrong. Uh, you, it is okay to express anxiousness and doubtfulness. Let's talk about it. There is a prompting of being curious that is acceptable amongst children. There's a prompting of ask all the questions you want amongst children. We love when kids ask questions. In fact, there are tons of kids books that literally are just devoted to this. Some of them are, one of them is called The Crayons Book of Feelings. If you've ever had the Crayons series, fantastic series if you want just something really colorful and fun. But The Crayons Book of Feelings, the other one, we actually own all of these, but In My Heart is a interactive book you can write in that talks about the feelings that you have and it goes down different layers of what's in your heart today. I Can Handle It is a fantastic champion of, hey, you can handle everything, even if you're scared, even if you're doubtful, even if it's hard, you can handle it. And then God made all your feelings. And it, it actually, this book is uh, using scripture to kind of talk through, hey, if you are sad, if you are alone, if you are angry, if you are happy, if you are joyful, God made all of your feelings. We lean into kids expressing and feeling all of their feelings. But something happens once we become adults, and I don't know why, but sometimes it feels as if we are not allowed as adults to express doubt or to explore or to feel anything other than contentment, right? Especially in the church sometimes. And I don't think that that's how God designed human beings to be. That's not the reality of human emotions. You all experience doubt and fear and anxiety. And it's not the reality of what we see these disciples displaying in this story. And yet, we never see Jesus denying their questions. He brings them in, he is patient, and he spends the rest of the road to Emmaus 
teaching them and walking them through the scripture patiently, right? That's a fascinating response to these two disciples who knew the scriptures, knew the prophecies, watched everything happen, and yet they still were doubtful. He patiently takes them through it. They were so enthralled by Christ's words that we find out what they do next. In verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going farther, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening and the day is almost over. And so he went in to stay with them. They were so fixated on what this stranger was teaching them, they had something stirring in their hearts and they wanted more because Jesus patiently took them through the process, right? So verse 30, when he sat down at the table, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked on the road and opened the scriptures up to us? They knew, they knew something was special about this stranger. They couldn't put a pin on it. And what's fascinating is it wasn't until Christ sat down at the table, took the bread, this symbolic gesture that he literally had done four days prior with them, broke it and handed it to them that they they realized who they had been with the entire day, and it was Jesus. He was patient and spent a good deal of time with them and met them where they were at. So that's the first account of Jesus appearing to his disciples. We're gonna look right now, right after the second account. And what's fascinating about these two stories is that they are mere images of each other and how Jesus does it. So the road to Emmaus, he approaches these disciples. They do not recognize who he is. He talks with them through the entire process, sits down and eats with them, and then they realize who he is, right? We're gonna see it in reverse with this next story. To kind of get us into this, the the two disciples from the road to Emmaus run out and go tell the other 11 disciples who were hiding in an upper room what had just happened. And that's where this second account picks up. But I think John 20 actually does a fantastic idea of describing the vibe in that upper room because that's really important for us to understand. John 20 says, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear, of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, peace be with you. The 11 disciples were so afraid of what was gonna happen to them because of what they had just witnessed that happened to Jesus and because they were known associates of Jesus that they were hiding out in an upper room, scared to death. They were frightened. So these two other disciples come and tell them all about it and then Jesus appears in the middle of the room that was locked. And they were startled in verse 37 and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So in the mirror of this story, Jesus immediately shows them who he is. And yet, They still doubted, right? They still doubted. On the road to Emmaus, they were kept hidden from it and they got to hear all the teachings and they got to have their hearts stirred. In this story, they get to see firsthand right away and yet they are still doubtful and scared. But Jesus takes his time to show them the physical evidence of himself, right? In verse 40, when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe, it was because of joy and amazement. He asked them, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. Now, both of these stories have a really interesting aspect that they, the center of understanding happens around food, right? The first road to Emmaus, it wasn't until he broke bread and, bread and passed it to them that their eyes were open. In this story, it wasn't until they physically saw him eat something that they're like, oh, okay, he's not a ghost. He's not a ghost, guys. He just ate a piece of fish. It went down. It didn't fall out like Casper. <laughs> it's okay. It's good. <laughs> I, lo- I love that because I think he really wanted to show them, I am in a bodily form now. This is not a spirit. This is not a ghost. But it took that act 
for them to believe. Jesus eating a meal in the presence of disciples served as an important element of the resurrection tradition, reinforcing the fact that Jesus conquered the grave and rose again and came forth as a body. So then in verse 45, he opened their minds so that they could understand the scripture. And then in verse 48, he says, you are witnesses of these things now, right? So this is the commissioning of the disciples. And I think what we have to remember with our Arise series, this is the commissioning of ourselves. We all now know the scriptures. The disciples were watching the scriptures unfold in real time. We have the benefit of having the entire book and getting to see how the prophecies were fulfilled and getting to study it. But that doesn't mean that we are not commissioned. We are just as much commissioned as the disciples of that time were. The purpose of this appearance was not just to dispel doubt, but it was to commission all of them for the ministry that they were about to walk forward. Because they're witnesses of all of this now. They have seen it. Jesus opened their minds, much like we have the ability now to look at the breadth of scripture and have our minds opened. And now because of that, we get to be witnesses to the world. So what does that look like for us, right? Now that we've kind of explored these two stories. Well, I think there are three very important points which in the, within these stories. And the first one is your first point, And it is, let us walk with Jesus. Let us walk with Jesus. Prior to Jesus' death in his ministry in Mark 9, there was a father of a demon-possessed boy that went to Jesus and begged him for help. And he said, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. I, I do believe, but help me overcome my disbelief. The disciples had already tried and failed to help this boy, but rather than rebuke this official for his lack of faith, Jesus heals the boy then and there. He didn't wait for the father's faith to be 100% or anything near it. He healed his son. I think that that's what it means to walk with Jesus, that you do not have to be perfect in your faith or 100% in your faith, but as long as you are moving forward, you are going to learn. Kelly Brown uh, Douglas, an Episcopal priest and theologian, says this about the resurrection hope. She says, it took me a while to get there. It was a journey through despair to faith, through doubt, and back to faith, through crucifixion and to resurrection. It affirmed and made me really believe that faith and doubt go together. Even though I can come out and say at the end there's resurrection hope, that doesn't mean that it's a once and for all journey and I won't have to walk this journey again. Faith is not a one-time journey. I teach that in my class at APU that we are disciples of Christ, but this is a lifelong journey. It's not a I have arrived and now I need to do no more work kind of journey. It is a every single day pick up your cross kind of journey, right? And every day is going to bring different emotions into it. So if you are in a position right now where your walk, you are struggling, that's okay. Jesus has the patience and the ability to pick that up and walk alongside with you, regardless of what percentage of faith you have. That should be so freeing to hear. God is with us in our pain. He doesn't necessarily remove it, but he's there to sit with us, to help us cope with life, to deal with pressure and failure and guilt and pain and hopes and dreams, not just to take it away by magic, but to sit with us and be with us and walk with us. And we see Jesus doing just that on the road to Emmaus. He knew immediately that these two disciples did not recognize him at all. And he could have just thrown it right in their face. They were just with him three days ago. How do you not recognize me? And yet he took the time to listen to them, to walk with them, to hear them, and then to teach them. So CCF, let us walk with Jesus. The second point is let us talk with Jesus. In John's account of these post-resurrection appearances, he mentions a disciple called Thomas. 
And if you've ever heard of Thomas, there's a couple songs about him. He's often called Doubting Thomas, which of all the things to have marked you as a disciple, the fact that this poor guy is like, oh, Doubting Thomas, that is literally his legacy, unfortunately. But it's because of this. In John's um, version, he says, uh, Thomas says this, after hearing the women and the other disciples say the tomb is empty, he says, unless I see the nail marks, in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, I will not believe. Thomas wanted a lot of proof. Thomas, need, Thomas I like to think of Thomas as a tactile person. He, is, he's a, uh, he needs to like see it and, and play with it to understand it, like to like visually, like people that, that need Play-Doh to like learn. So I think Thomas is like that. He's a tactile learner. But rather than rebuking Thomas and being like, how dare you even ask for that? Jesus literally says, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. He doesn't rebuke Thomas for the request. He lets Thomas physically see and touch the wounds. There's a fantastic book called The Unlikely Disciple, and it's a book that I've occasionally assigned in, in my class, and it follows this young man, this 20-year-old guy, who he was not religious at all, but he was really fascinated by organized religion, particularly evangelical Christianity. And so he decided to go undercover at a Christian university and learn what it was that made students love this religion, made students kind of buy into this. And he went to one of the most conservative Christian universities called Liberty University, um, that it, it has a ton of rules and regulations on their students. Like you can't be out of your dorms after 10. Uh, you can't hold hands on campus. Uh, you, there's a lot. You can read the book. It's fascinating. But he joins this university because he's like, I want to go undercover. I want to write a book about what makes this work. And in the process, he does everything that they tell him he should do. So if they tell him that he needs to read his Bible three times a day and pray twice a day, he made sure he did that. He joined every Bible study that he was told he should join. He, uh, <laughs> they have a lot of rules about courting at this university. And so he decided to try courting as an option for dating because he's like, what is this all about? Let me learn. And I really respect his perspective because it was a very unbiased look about Christianity. The takeaway, and I don't want to spoil where he kind of ended up, but the one aspect of Christianity that he grasped and loved and continues to practice is prayer. It's prayer. I'll spoil it. He doesn't still believe he doesn't believe, I would actually argue he does, but according to him, he didn't join a Christian university, he didn't join a church, but the one practice he still does is prayer. That's saying something. In our most desperate times, I have watched people who have zero faith get on their knees and say, all right, I can't do it anymore. I need to talk with you, I need your help. There's something to be said about our human nature and the desperation that we get to where we turn to prayer no matter what. And I truly believe that these two stories are witness to that, that no matter where you are on the journey, no matter how much faith or how little faith you have, you get to talk with Jesus. There's no requirement whatsoever on his part. He wants to hear it. He wants to listen. He wants to be there with us. Again, how freeing is that? In Romans 8, I think it sums it up really well. Actually, I want to stand while we read this. Um, I'll read the first part and I'll tell you when to jump in, but please stand with me while we read this because I think it's, it's that powerful and I want to be fully in on it, all right? So Romans 8. I'm going to read the first, first two verses and I'm going to ask you to join in with me. Who shall separate from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Join with me in 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height 
nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. Right? You may be seated. Nothing can separate us from God's love. So as long as we are continuing to take steps forward with him and talking with him, even when we are doubtful, when we are frustrated, when we are anxious, when we are fearful, none of those things are bigger than God. And he wants to hear our hearts. And he wants to take into consideration all of those things that we are dealing with right now. He is bigger than our fears and our doubts. It is not a requirement to have 100% faith in order to talk with Jesus, which is so, so freeing. So let us talk with Jesus. And then the third point is let us witness like Jesus. Let us witness like Jesus. In both those stories, Jesus takes time to present biblical evidence concerning his suffering and his death and his resurrection. But he is patient. He meets the disciples where they're at, in the upper room where they are scared to death. They've literally locked themselves in and they are clinging for their lives and fearful. He meets them right there. He meets them on the road when they are doubtful and discouraged and confused and they're just trying to process what just happened. He meets them there. He allows their questions and their concerns and their doubts and he holds them all together. And at the height of understanding in both stories, it happens around a meal. So CCF, what if we were known as a church who says to people, whatever you are struggling with, whatever doubts, whatever questions, whatever temptations you are dealing with, God understands those difficulties you are facing because he's faced them himself. What if we were a church known as that? We all have fears and insecurities and temptations and unanswered questions. And God is big enough and loves us enough to sit with us and talk with us and be with us and hold it all. There's a fantastic book by Chalky and Wakis, um, two, two authors, and they say this in the book. They say, home is where, and they're talking about the church, home is where you don't have to pretend. Human beings are made for community, and communities that are worth belonging to are honest. The honest church. What if we were to witness like Christ did? What if we were to come alongside people for an extended amount of time, walking with them, talking with them, sharing a meal with them, giving them the space to learn and grow, and showing them that they can belong even before they believe? What if we were to witness like Christ did? coming alongside people, showing others compassion and care and love, just as Christ did for those disciples and for all of us. What if we were known as an honest, authentic church where people knew they could come as they are? How freeing would that be? That they knew that they would not have to put on a front and put on a mask in order to enter this room. But they could come just as they are, broken, beaten down, needing someone to just listen to them, needing someone to recognize the struggles that they have in their life, the doubts that they have, the fears they have, and hold it with them, not trying to do anything else but that. Because that's what Jesus did to his disciples, his closest friends, that's what he did with them. In all four Gospels, Throughout the breadth of the Gospels, and I encourage you, go read it, Jesus is shown that his disciples that he has gathered with them make mistake after mistake. They are a funny, funny group of people, alternating between intense faith and then crippling doubt. All four Gospels show this. But how did Jesus respond? He didn't shame them. He didn't make fun of them. He didn't crack down hard on them. He gave them space and never demanded absolute certainty or doctrinal orthodoxy. Now, that's a big word, but he never demanded that. He gently worked with them, listened to their doubts, coached and mentored them through their temptations, through their fears, through their trials and misunderstandings, and led them to a place of strength. 
Chalkinwak has finished out that, that book and say that Jesus doesn't give us certainty. Instead, he invites us to have faith. And that's very different. That's very different. He accepted, as we've seen in these two accounts, and again, as we would see over the breadth of the Gospels, if you can do an in-depth study, that even his closest and most loyal followers and friends would have their doubts and their misunderstandings with him. But rather than adopting a policy of zero tolerance with them, he encouraged them to explore their doubts in order to deepen their faith. And I truly believe that if we are to allow people to explore their doubts with curiosity and a, a need to want to know more, people's faith is going to deepen. We shouldn't stifle that. We should encourage them to keep exploring not to the point of apathy, but to the point of curiosity, right? So I'm going to call up the worship team right now. Um, church, I think that honest churches must begin where people are, not where we assume that they are or where we would like them to be. Honest churches need to begin where people are right now. And we can only discover that by listening to them with humility and compassion and patience. This last quote while the worship team gets set up is by Vincent um, Backot, and he's an associate professor of theology at Wheaton College. He says this, in the end, the reason for staying in the game is the same for getting into it in the first place. God gave humans a great commission and never rescinded it. God gave humans a great commission. Our new mission and vision for CCF is just that, to live out the greatest commandment and the great commission. And that's the resurrection hope, right? Hope is an active thing, just like the resurrection is an active thing. And I think you have seen that through our Arise series, that it is a call to live, do good works, and be followers of Christ. It requires people to move and go back to Galilee and recommit themselves to the ministry of Jesus. So we're going to sing about hope right now. I encourage you to dwell on that and to remind yourselves that Jesus never, ever, ever demanded 100%. He just demanded that you show up, whatever state you are in, right? All right, I'm turning it over.